and I'm happy to announce Mr. Brent Kugelmas. <laughs> He's not only uh, the head of, um, no, the CEO of uh, the Energy Impact Center, but uh, he also knows everybody. So, Mr. Kugelmas, uh, you're welcome here on stage, and uh, we're eager to hear what you can tell us about uh, the reversing climate change. Dobar dan. Hvala za pabobilu v vašu prelepo državo. We all gather here at a very important time and place. Never before has the world been more prosperous, very much thanks to abundant energy. Yet it seems these resources, which have given us so much wealth, will also lead us on a path toward environmental catastrophe and perhaps take it all away. But is this a choice we really have to make? Can't we have prosperity, abundance, consumption, but also environmental preservation and a stable climate? According to many of the loudest voices in the climate change debate, no. They insist that we have to sacrifice and tax ourselves that half the world must stay in energy poverty. But I reject this notion. So today, we are gonna walk through what the climate conversation has wrong. Similarly, we will discuss what the nuclear industry has wrong. And I will present a path forward where we can fix both, and our planet along the way. Solving climate change won't be easy, but before this talk is over, I hope you will agree it can be simple and you will see the central role that Slovenia has to play. The mainstream narrative around climate change has two things wrong. The first, just how important energy access is, that for most, it means more to them than climate change does. And the second, just how much energy will be required to stop our planet from warming. Let's start with number one. Although we don't touch energy directly very much throughout the day, it's far more than just petrol and leaving your lights on longer. Energy is in food, medicine, buildings. Energy moves goods and people around the globe. Energy is in everything that you need, and energy is at the core about what you love about a prosperous world. Restricting energy, on the other hand, with higher costs, means real hardship is spread throughout every part of life. This is why we decide to subsidize energy at every opportunity, as the benefits from inexpensive power are so profound. Let's observe a very similar trade-off humanity has already made. We knowingly continue to pollute the air with particulate, causing millions of cancers and asthmas every year just to receive slightly cheaper energy. We have had the medical reasons and the technology to replace coal for over half a century. But the only thing that ever meaningfully has is another cheaper form of power. Do we really expect a worldwide consensus on sacrifice now across all age, class, and creed to combat a threat distant in time and place? What the climate elite ignore is that to anyone but the absolute wealthiest, Choosing more expensive energy isn't even an option. So I claim that to solve climate change, considering the history and present state of this societal trade-off, we will need an energy source that is both carbon-free and the cheapest possible source, not just for electricity, but for heat as well. And if that wasn't hard enough, this brings us to problem number two. Who here believes that if we were to eliminate all new emissions across every sector, that that would fix climate change. It won't even slow it down. You heard me correctly. Zero out all emissions globally in every single sector. Electricity, transportation, agriculture, industry, heat, and you would not even notice a difference. The atmosphere would continue to add extra heat at the exact same rate that we are adding extra heat today. Greenhouse gases act as a valve, not a sponge. 
Carbon dioxide in the air controls the rate of heat addition, not the magnitude of temperature. So until we remove the 1,000 gigatons of CO2 that we've already emitted, the Earth will continue to grow warmer and warmer every year, year over year. Even if we eliminated all new emissions but did nothing about the past, the end result, but for a slight shift in time, would be exactly the same as if we had done nothing at all. Most experts won't acknowledge this because the implications of which limit us to a very narrow subset of solutions. You see, virtually all climate advocates who claim to be on the right side of science, when convenient to their agenda, totally ignore the math. If we want to stop climate change at all, we have to create so much low carbon energy that we can, one, replace all fossil fuels, two, account for the embedded emissions of that energy source, and three, power the removal of the last 200 years worth of carbon emissions. Two years ago, I started the Energy Impact Center with that problem in mind. Two years ago, I had never met a single nuclear engineer in my life. And two years ago, when I ran that math, everything changed. You see, if you take those two constraints, that you must account for previous emissions and do it so in a way that directly increases prosperity, that leaves us only one path. We must take the very things that require energy and result in the release of carbon dioxide and force them by definition to capture and sequester carbon dioxide. In other words, we need to make fuel and products with hydrocarbons, just as we do today, but with hydrogen and carbon from the air instead of from the ground. In this scenario, nothing downstream needs to change, and the energy consumption all of a sudden has the exact opposite effect on climate. Let me make this crystal clear. If you use carbon from the air, the more people consume, the more prosperity we enable, the faster we will solve climate change. This is complete alignment of individual behavior, market forces, environmental health, and human well-being. If you want to actually solve climate change, you just need to make carbon-negative fuels cheaper than carbon-positive fuels. But to do so requires extreme energy abundance and an extremely low carbon footprint. According to the laws of physics, there is only one energy source that is powerful enough to meet those requirements. When I learned that atomic forces are three million times the strength of chemical bonds, I almost couldn't believe it. And for the first time, I knew climate change was truly conquerable. To have synthetic fuels compete economically with fossil fuels, you need to produce heat three times cheaper. You start off with a three million times advantage, and in order to save the world, the goal is just to get three times cheaper. After I learned about that energy density, from that moment I swore I would talk to every person in the entire nuclear industry if I had to, in order to understand how we can make this a reality. I am now over 1,500 such conversations in, and today I will share with you what I have learned. In the last two years, I've asked over 10,000 questions to experts across technology, politics, industry, regulations, economics, and more. 100 trips, 50 site visits to labs and power plants, a dozen countries, and only God knows how many conferences. I have never met such a talented group of people, masters of chemistry, physics, operations, engineering, and I am truly honored to now consider myself part of this community. This is what makes what I'm about to say so much more difficult. The challenges the nuclear industry faces are entirely our own fault. As the only group that is powerful enough to destroy a six order of magnitude advantage is the very group that possesses it. How is it possible that an otherwise standard thermal power plant with negligible fuel costs is more expensive than a coal plant? 
How is it possible that an industry has become so obsessed with safety when they started off with the naturally safest power source that could ever exist? Fukushima proved that even with three gigawatt scale meltdowns, where every single safety is rendered inoperable, that a light water reactor is so harmless that not a single person gets hurt. The public mistrust is rational. The attacks from environmentalists are deserved, not because nuclear energy is dangerous, but because we have convinced them it is. The nuclear industry has gotten itself into a suicidal spiral where we'll spend any amount of money to make a plant ever more safe. And that is the very thing that convinces people it is not. The more safety we require, the less support we'll have from the public. Because the public does not run a probabilistic risk assessment to go about their day. They develop an intuition based on what they see. By separating nuclear plants from major cities, by burying them in concrete, by securing them with mini armies, by inspecting them constantly with an independent authority, we convince the public that what is inside must be so dangerous it warrants such disproportionate measures. And then we have the audacity to act surprised when the public is scared. We, la we scoff at their lack of education when we were the ones who miseducated them. Why would a nuclear building be more of a risk to public health than a normal apartment building? Does an apartment building not hold hundreds of lives in the balance every day? Could it not be also built with insufficient structural or fire protection? Is it not at risk of being hit by an airplane? For God's sakes, in a nuclear reactor room, there's no one even inside to get hurt. For the last 60 years, American institutions have bullied the whole world into a safety culture, making nuclear plants so complicated and expensive that only Westinghouse et al. has the expertise to sell them. They use the ICRP to insist radiation is classified as a uniquely dangerous threat, even at one becker out. They use the NRC and the IEA to demand that everyone adhere to extremely expensive standards for equipment and operation. We have sold the lie that a nuclear accident is one of disproportionate hazard. To bolster our industry, not one that sells electrons, but one that sells radiation protection. What we sell is fear. How can we even look ourselves in the mirror and say that we care about safety at all, when every cold death suffered is our fault? Because it is us who refuse to allow society a cheaper alternative. In the name of safety culture, we have driven the naturally safest technology into obsolescence. In effect, promoting every other less safe energy source. Our greatest challenge to overcome is not public support. It's not the environmentalists. It's not cheap gas. Our greatest challenge to overcome is ourselves. Making nuclear the cheapest source of energy on planet Earth does not require a fundamental change in engineering. It requires a fundamental change in culture. Which is why I am here in Slovenia today. I am here in Slovenia because Slovenia is uniquely positioned to become a leader in a cultural transformation. To do as Alois Knafelt would have and blaze a trail for the rest of the world to follow. Slovenia has three key elements to stand up to the rest of the nuclear world. One, intellectual excellence at the Johef Stefan Institute. Two, experience and credibility from operating the Krishko nuclear power plant. And three, a regulator that is talented and confident enough to permit fundamental change to work on behalf of Slovenian people and not American companies. You have the three key elements to usher in a new era of environmental and economic prosperity, and this is how. Slovenia, if you know how to maintain an existing plant, you are capable of designing and building a new one on your own. Just copy the essentials that you see at Krishko 
and leave out anything that goes beyond what you'd include in any other industrial facility, which is about 90% of materials, people, and processes. Use local engineering, local construction, and local manufacturing firms. You have everything that you need to develop a thriving, homegrown nuclear industry. In just a few years, you could guarantee the cheapest energy on planet Earth for your citizens, and in doing so, create a serious advantage for your industries for years to come. You can improve the health of hundreds of thousands, save real lives, not statistical ones, by virtually eliminating air pollution overnight. You could double your economy, selling electrons to Italy and beyond, instead of selling your natural beauty to tourists. And you could become a model for Europe and the rest of the world to follow. And for the rest of human history, be remembered as the country that actually solved climate change. This is well within your grasp. And in order to make this a reality, all you have to do is be contrarian. Be the first country to publicly state what we in this room all know to be true, that a light water reactor meltdown has no consequence to public health. When I was preparing this for this speech, I reached out to several Slovenians and I asked, what do you love most about your country? Many times I heard the same answer. We are small, but beautiful. The fact that you are small is not something to apologize for. It is your advantage. Being small means you are agile. You are small, but you have everything that you need to take the rest of the world into a future of boundless abundance, a future of environmental health, a future of nuclear energy. You are beautiful, but the world needs you to be brave. Voila.